Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We are watching precious metals prices start to surge, and it looks like we are at the beginning of a metals bull market. Our interview is with one of the best experts in the field. Our guest today is Mr. Andy Schechtman. Andy is the owner and president of Miles Franklin LTD. Miles Franklin is a full-service precious metals company. The company specializes in the sale of bullion and the strategies for diversifying assets as well as offering each client extensive education into building their own portfolio. It's an amazing company to get acquainted with and we're happy to have him here. Andy, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great, Michelle. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? Hope, hope you're doing well. Yes, staying safe as everything goes crazy in the world. But we want to focus in today on precious metals and what's happening for our audience. We want to keep everyone up to speed on this as it looks like it's moving rather quickly. Prices are taking sure off. Is. And Andy, many experts are predicting that we are at the beginning of a historic bull market. What are your thoughts? There's no question about that, Michelle. Uh, there, to to really, all you really need to know, and to put an exclamation point behind that statement, is uh, what happened in April of 2019. So let me take you back a few years, even before that. Um, since 1944, there's been one tier one asset on the planet, and it's been U.S. treasuries and U.S. dollar deposits since Bretton Woods. A tier one asset, if you Google it you'll see that it's, de it's defined by being a riskless asset. And so other than market risk, U.S. dollars and U.S. treasuries were considered a, or are still considered a riskless asset. Now, I, there may be a lot of people, myself included, who would take exception with that, but suffice it to say, prior to 2017, uh, or through 2017, the world's central banks were typically net sellers of gold always selling what was a tier three asset in, in precious metals or gold rather, a tier three asset meaning only 50% was counted on the balance sheet. And so uh, there were always four reasons that central banks would always be wanting to shed their gold. One, paid no interest. Two, it was unpredictable. Three, uh, it cost money to store. But the biggest reason that the central banks were always selling their gold prior to 2018, really, through 2017, was the 50% haircut on the balance sheet. It would denigrate the ability to sell bonds. Now, in 2018, something very interesting happened that kind of shapes my feeling that we are indeed in a whole new bull market and a whole new way of looking at metals. In 2018, out of nowhere, the central banks did a 180 degree turn in the way that they view precious metals and they accumulated as a group 60 times more gold than they had in the previous, um, so let me rephrase that, they, they purchased um, 85 times more gold than they had in the previous 60 years combined. Sorry about that. In 2019, those numbers were up 90%. And so you're seeing a massive shift from no gold to massive accumulation out of nowhere in 2018. Now, this was with no warning. In April of 2019, the uh, central banks through the Bank of International Settlements located in Basel, Switzerland, reclassified gold as a tier one asset, the only other tier one asset on the planet next to U.S. dollars. So the central banks completely flip-flopped front ran that decision, accumulated massive amounts, and in 2019, even after that massive accumulation in 18, they accumulated 90% more than they did the previous year. You're talking the most sophisticated, well-funded, well-informed, and influential traders on the planet, amassing enormous quantities of gold and silver, and well, gold in particular, and de-dollarizing. It's setting the stage, in my opinion, for what will be um, a whole new way that the world views precious metals. When these types of powerful people, the most sophisticated and well-influenced and well-funded traders on the planet, uh, when they look at gold now as a tier one asset out of the clear blue, it should tell you what the long game is for gold. After 80 years nearly of it just being U.S. treasuries and dollars, and if you look at a chart from 2019 to where we are now, it moves up at a straight line 45 degree angle. I want to add one more point to that. The second most relevant, important, game-changing event of my career is the 
uh, six federal indictments for racketeering charges levied upon J.P. Morgan. Uh, J.P. Morgan now is uh, in the midst of an ongoing Justice Department inquiry. Uh, they have been labeled by the Justice Department, their precious metals desk, as a criminal enterprise. If your listeners were to Google J.P. Morgan Rico, you'll see that six of their traders have been indicted with federal racketeering charges. This is a big deal. And it happened right around March. You look at what's happened to gold and silver since March. It's unbelievable. Uh, around March 17th, gold uh, silver bottomed at about $11.80 or 90 cents. Today, it's almost 25. So it's over doubled. In, in the period just of a few months, and gold is up 35 or 40 percent since then. So you have the, the largest concentrated short position out of the market uh, the, the, that has been indicted on racketeering charges, and you can see a semblance of what a free market looks like since then. And you have the most sophisticated traders on the planet, the central banks, reclassifying gold as the only tier one asset in the world next to U.S. dollars. So the road to higher prices is definitely pointing north. And you can see that uh, when the central banks and the commercial banks take a whole new view on precious metals, A, in their value, and B, on not shorting it on COMEX anymore, um, it, it portrays for much, much, much higher prices moving forward, Michelle. That is extraordinary. I want to go into that a little bit more. I want to explore what your thoughts are on the racketeering that takes place um, within the precious metals market, specifically by the banks? Well, so what the, what the uh, commercial banks were doing would, would be uh, they would suck in the speculators by letting the price rise. And as all that money would come in in the form of options, they would then uh, wait until it got real close to options expiration, and then they'd smash the price. It's called spoofing. They would, they would, um, and just one of many things that they would do, but the spoofing would be a whole bunch of uh, large sell orders and pull it back immediately. But the industry or the market sees that and thinks it's moving lower and everyone jumps on board of it. It's highly, highly illegal. And so what they were doing is sucking in the speculators, bidding up the price, and then smashing the price below options, be below the expiration levels of where all all those options were set to expire, rendering the options worthless. They would collect the premiums and they would rinse, wash, and repeat. Let it go up, suck in the speculators, smash it. The options expire worthless. They make tons and tons of money. They had a license to print money, in essence, by controlling the market, by letting it rise, smashing it. The shorts would, would drop. They would cover their shorts and go right back up and do it over and over and over again. It's very interesting that what's happening, however, is I'd like you to think of the COMEX market as Caesar's Palace. Um, most of the time when people would go to Las Vegas, very, very few people would stand for delivery on, on the COMEX market. I'd like to equate that to people leaving Las Vegas with money in their pocket. Very few people. The rest of them would get crushed and that's kind of what would happen on the COMEX. Let me explain. Uh, the COMEX, for the most part, was a specul is a speculative ende endeavor for a lot of uh, speculators. They are betting on the way that the market moves. For a company like myself or for a farmer in Nebraska trying to hedge his or her production, the COMEX is real. For example, a farmer in, in Nebraska who at the beginning of May, as he's planting his fields, doesn't want to risk to speculation what the next five months will be like with weather and, and what the crop will, will be like. So he, he or she can sell forward their production into the market. So they'll sell a thousand bushels of corn at a certain price to guarantee that they get that price at the end of the year, no matter what happens. Could be a bumper year, could be a really bad year. You never know. For a company like myself, if I have a thousand ounces of gold in the warehouse, I have to sell a thousand ounces on COMEX to remain market neutral because if the price drops on what I have in my warehouse, it will rise commensurately with what I sold short on COMEX. That is a legitimate hedging platform uh, and a legitimate use for, for hedging. But most of the people out there, including the commercial banks in particular, would naked short the price to drive down, to create a perception of reality and to make tons of money. The difference is this, normally, that market only sees a very, very few number of, of uh, participants standing for delivery. And if someone shorts, meaning selling something, especially if it's naked that they don't have, on the other side of that trade is someone going long. It's a zero-sum game. Someone always takes the other side. 
What's happening is that over the last few delivery months, the COMEX has turned into a delivery mechanism. It never has been. In other words, the COMEX is typically a, a, a speculative vehicle whereby no one ever stands for delivery. Only a very small portion of the contracts issued, people say, give me my gold, give me my silver. Now, in order for that market to remain legitimate, it has to deliver metal if people ask for it. Otherwise, what the heck is the price if no one can get their product based upon that, that marketplace? Over the last two or three delivery months in both gold and silver, there is a tremendous number of, of people calling the bluff of the commercial bank saying, okay, fine, I'll take delivery at that point. If you're a refiner and you can buy 100,000 ounces of silver at spot and then take possession of it, hedge your exposure, sell it short on the COMEX, so you have 100,000 ounces of physical here, you sold short down paper, so it's market neutral, and then you sell silver buffaloes at three or $4 premium over the price of silver, you're making that money, that three or $4, which equates to 20 or 30% with no risk, you're printing money all day long. In other words, the refiners and the big money centers are standing for delivery. They're calling the bluff on the commercial banks, which means they have to come up and come up with metal in many cases that they don't have, which is really, really, really risky. And it's a whole new ball game because it never happened before. Last month alone, JP Morgan had to deliver 30 million ounces of silver. That's 20% of all the silver they had on the COMEX. It woke them up. I think it was a spiritual experience for many of the other commercial banks who seem to be covering in mass right now as the price continues to rise unabated. So the bottom line is simply this. The fact that people are standing for delivery has changed the whole dynamic. And I'll put it into three very important things for people to listen to. Number one, gold's reclassified as the only tier one asset. Number two, the Justice Department levels six racketeering indictments against JP Morgan. And number three, the, the COMEX market is turning into a delivery mechanism that is cutting off their ability to short the market. And because if they continue to short and they continue to get called on the carpet, and if you're naked shorting something you don't have, and all of a sudden you have huge, huge institutions saying, okay, I want it. Now you got to go into the open market and buy it. As the price goes higher, your risks are unlimited. And so I think you're seeing a whole new ball game. The problem that most people have is recency bias, and they're waiting for the other shoe to drop, as it has for the past 12 years. Um, those days are coming to an end. I would like all of your listeners to Google something. It's very important, and that is Chris Marcus, or Arcadia Economics, Bart Chilton, C-H-I-L-T-O-N. Bart Chilton was the former head of the Commodity Future Trading Commission, the CFTC, where on Chris's show, he admitted everything I'm saying to you. He admitted that JP Morgan inherited Bear Stearns short position in 2008 and only did so with the approval of the CFTC to get its, they were given a time frame to get their short position in order because when Jamie Dimon accepted this on, uh, through Hank Paulson and said, okay, we'll take it, but we need time to get our short position in order because our position limits with their positions that we're going to take put us over the position limit threshold. So they said, fine, you get a certain amount of time. Well, Bart Chilton came back to his superiors after that time had expired and said, not only have they not pared down their shorts, they've increased them. They need to be prosecuted. They're in violation of antitrust law. They're thumbing their, their, you know, their, their, their nose right in our face uh, or their thumb right in our face. We need to prosecute them and he was told to back down it was a political decision now Bart Chilton died about three weeks after that after he told his superiors that JP Morgan needed to be prosecuted I'm not saying that there is a correlation there but he died I believe of a heart attack a couple of weeks later everyone needs to listen to this it validates everything that I'm saying it's the first and only time I've ever heard a Fed governor admit that JP Morgan was in violation of all this well, of course, these new racketeering charges substantiate it. The reason I am dwelling on this and these three items is that you have the most sophisticated, well-funded, well-informed, influential traders on the globe that are looking at gold and silver as wealth for the first time ever. They're classifying it as a tier one asset, a riskless asset. They are trying to, to stop the overt manipulation and naked shorting of the market. And these types of deals are once in a generation opportunities for people to shed their recency bias, to look at the fundamentals, to look at the economics of it and, and make a stance because look, 
where are your alternatives, Michelle? You have you have stocks trading at all time highs with 50 million people unemployed. You have the uh, uh, interest rates on the 10 year treasury right now at at, at um, under six tenths of a percent at 0.59 percent issued by an insolvent country that's created seven trillion dollars worth of inflation since last September. Nobody would buy those but the Fed. We are entering into a whole new a whole new time where owning precious metals has never been more important and, and more relevant to financial survival as far as I'm concerned. Right, right. I want to get into the printing of money and the effect that it's having upon not just metals, but on cryptocurrencies. And Andy, it's very interesting that cryptos, especially Bitcoin specifically, is sort of mirroring precious metals. It's taking off at the same time. And I want you to speak to that phenomenon for a moment. Well, you know, first of all, when we talk about inflation, um, since September, as I mentioned, the Fed has produced or created $7 trillion. Um, And it took this country over 300 years to create $800 billion in wealth. The, 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 The amount of inflation that is being pumped into the system is tremendous. Most of that has been holed up in financial assets like stocks, bonds, and real estate. Um, And the reason I think that you're seeing this is kind of twofold, but the biggest reason to me is that it used to be that stocks were considered risk on and bonds were considered risk off. And so when people would get scared, well, let's talk about even before they got scared, Traditionally, they would make money during their working years and invest in stocks. That's risk on. As they would get closer to retirement age, they would pour their money into risk off. So typically, the bond market was considered a safe investment because you're buying U.S. Treasury bonds that are backed by the U.S. government paying us a fair rate of return. When I started Miles Franklin in 1990, you could buy a 10-year Treasury paying 9%. And so you could put $2 million into treasury bonds at 9%, make $180,000 a year, never touch your principal, live like a king or a queen, and pass that money on to your your children, the principal. Now, at at 0.59%, that same $2 million doesn't even net you $11,000 or just over $11,000. So you can't live off of that. The risk-off category is gone. The inverse correlation between stocks and bonds are gone. And so they are now positively correlated to interest rates, as is the real estate market. So think about alternatives. Stocks, no. Bonds, definitely no. And real estate, absolutely no. They're all positively correlated to the um, abnormally low interest rates we have. And with interest rates at at less than six-tenths of a percent, with inflation running at two or three percent or higher, according to John Williams, probably three or four times at shadowstats.com, you're going backwards. So we look at alternatives. The alternatives are few and far between. It's cryptocurrencies and it's precious metals. It's the only place out there that has any semblance of value, any semblance of realistic value moving forward. And so I think what you're seeing is a lack of alternatives to safely put your money and people are Uh, not putting their money into bonds anymore because that's the mother of all bubbles. So they find a bastion of safety in precious metals and, uh, and in cryptocurrencies. Now I'm not a cryptocurrency uh, buff. I don't know enough about it other than to simply say to me, it is a reflection of uh, a lack of alternatives and people being afraid looking to escape the dollar and, there are no safe havens anymore with the exception of precious metals. And in my opinion, to a lesser degree, cryptocurrencies. And I say a lesser degree, Michelle, because I, I have a belief that we are this close to seeing a new digital dollar. Um, Nancy Pelosi called for it way back when in March on her House subcommittee finance bill was rejected. Forbes magazine said we're getting much closer to one. And when we take a step back and see the reclassification of gold, here's my, my prediction. Uh, in the very near future, you will see, after this system blows up, you will see a new dollar backed by gold. Now, I don't think it will be uh, convertible, but I think it will have a tie to gold, maybe let's say 20 or 30 percent. And I think a distributed ledger will be used to validate the gold on 
uh, that is backing the new currency. You know, they say that COVID can live on paper currency. They want a cashless society. They want to put their thumb on everybody. I think they will issue a new digital dollar that'll be tied to gold to give it legitimacy, and it will, a blockchain will be used to validate the uh, that backing. So I think that when the Fed gets in the business of electronic or, or in crypto technology, they're going to have a very difficult time allowing cryptocurrencies to freely trade. Bitcoin being the biggest one, because Bitcoin is hedgeable on the commodity exchange. As a precious metals company, we take Bitcoin for precious metals because I can hedge it, which means if I'm a big trader on the COMEX, I can also sell short. I can try to control the price. If I'm the federal government or the Federal Reserve, I can really try to control the price. Now, I understand the whole concept of, of uh, decentralized um, uh uh, exchange or cryptocurrency would, would help to avoid that. And maybe some of the alternate currencies will, but Bitcoin is the one that I'm not convinced about because it can still be manipulated by the big traders on the COMEX. Bottom line is simply this. To me, they're moving up together because there are no other places to put your money with any semblance of return and with safety. They are. And um, so uh, it's it's something that I can see. I will. I, I would think the trend in that regard will continue for quite some time uh, until there's a crash. Because to put your money into stocks at the all time high with half of the half of the country unemployed or into the bond market with real negative interest rates is is a fool's errand. So that's really why it's happening because it's the only place you can safely put it with any semblance of of logic right now. Right. Now you touched on the danger behind what's happening here to people who are um, whistleblowers. There is a high element of criminal activity going on behind the scenes within the Federal Reserve, the precious metals markets. So I wanna talk about that just a little bit because it's something that people don't usually get into when they're talking about precious metals. You know, they talk about the manipulation of it, but they really don't talk about the danger that takes place to the people that are actually doing it and know about it and try to expose it? Well, you know, I, I think that there's always an element of, of risk when you're, when you're uh, out there on a limb. Um, it's the first time I've ever heard of someone um, dying, and I don't know if, if, that's, if it was a direct result of it or not. Um, look, the bottom line is simply this. People need to be made aware of what's happening. And, and uh, I, I think that there are, as far as I know, there are whistleblowers involved right now in the J.P. Morgan racketeering uh, investigation. The traders are cooperating with, um, with the Justice Department. Uh, these are markets that have not been allowed to trade freely for a very long time. And um, J.P. Morgan has... You have to understand that misdirection is not done in a vacuum. It's done for a reason. Uh, the manipulation and the misdirection was done for a reason. So we can go way, way back to when it started in the 90s, and it was done under a guise of something called Gibson's Paradox, which is the inverse relationship between real interest rates and gold. So the Western Central Banks, in an attempt to maintain a illusion of prosperity, uh, with low interest rates in our 401k in our home, they suppress the price of gold, which is the canary in the mine shaft, because Gibson's paradox says if you have super low interest rates, gold should go to the moon and vice versa. If you have 19 or 10 percent or 15 percent U.S. Treasury rates, people will invest in treasuries with safety and double their money every few years with the, the law of 70 seconds, where you take the the interest rate divided into 72 tells you how long before your principal doubles. Well, at six tenths of a percent, you're talking a very, very, very long time before your principal doubles. So anyways, the price of gold should be screaming. The central banks always suppressed it. Well, that changed and it changed for a reason. And that is because I believe at some point around 2007 or 2008, the Chinese started doing the same thing. And at some point, the central banks and the commercial banks went from manipulation of price to uh, maintain a perception through low interest rates to, to massive accumulation. So 
by Ted Butler's estimation, um, J.P. Morgan over the last 12 years has amassed north of 1 billion ounces of silver. That's 10 times what the Hunt brothers tried to buy and north of 30 million ounces of gold. It's the single largest physical position of metal the world has ever seen as they've held down the paper price. And so there are whistleblowers. There are um, uh, some of the traders that are, are cooperating with the Justice Department. But, you know, it's interesting, someone I respect in the industry, Doug Casey, used to say to me, there's no way that the J.P. Morgan traders could keep their mouth shut long enough in order to pull off this ruse. And I would stand up publicly speaking for years and, and say this, it was one of the only people that was really screaming at the, all the public speaking I did that the market was being manipulated. I do feel vindicated. Uh, I've had people tell me I need to watch my back uh, because I've been at conferences where I'm the only one with 5,000 people there attending, screaming, J.P. Morgan's manipulating the market. For the past five years, that's all I've talked about. And the fact that the Justice Department labels them as a criminal enterprise is, is vindication for me. Um, I don't think I'm high enough up on the totem pole where I need to worry, but certainly the head of the Commodity Future Trading Commission, the, the Fed gov or the governor of that organization is. And uh, when you're exposing... Uh, some of the most powerful people on the planet, yeah, you probably should watch your back. But um, I think that it will become more pervasive because we are, I think, turning the corner a little bit. And the action of the market right now is unlike anything I've ever seen. To see the market blowing through these round numbers in conjunction with um, or slight or right after those racketeering charges were le uh, levied, the market's gone straight up like this. You can see the correlation. Those two events, April 1st of last year and the Justice Department investigation are the two biggest events in my career, hands down. And there will be corollary consequences. There will be um, you know, whistleblowers and, and there will be people looking over their shoulder, but God bless them all because quite frankly, we have not had a free market uh, maybe ever in precious metals. And, and what we are seeing over the last couple of weeks at least resembles one, or certainly a whole lot more free than anything I've ever seen in 30 years. So uh, I, I, I give uh, kudos to those people who have the cur courage to do it. I have, uh, and you know, I'm just one little voice, but I think that the more people understand that, that these markets were not only being manipulated, but for a purpose. When you see JP Morgan amass 1 billion ounces of physical silver, that's the single largest position of silver the world's ever seen at one time, ever in human civilization. And so you have to understand the significance of it and then realize that there's opportunity to be found in this type of an environment. And what is happening right now, the unwinding of this manipulation is the opportunity of a generation. Um, and so it's, I feel it's my duty to tell people this. And, um, you know, I, I think that, more, the more people understand this, all you need to do is Google J.P. Morgan Rico, and the first thing you'll see is a Bloomberg article where it says Justice, Depor Justice Department labels uh, J.P. Morgan Precious Metals Trading Desk criminal enterprise, and this is still ongoing, so it hasn't been completed or resolved yet, but the six indictments have certainly, once they were levied, the price has gone straight up at a 45-degree angle, so it's, it's real, and I applaud the people who have the courage to stand up to this horrible manipulation and because uh, it's affecting a lot of people and a lot of businesses and uh, adversely. So it's time for, for some free markets in this country. Right. And the reason I bring it up is because what's happening behind the scenes is so much more extraordinary than what's happening in front of us. And what's happening in front of us is the fact that for the first time in many, many, many years, the manipulation has been taken off the top. So it's starting to move. And the fact that it's starting to move, and it could move very, very fast. And that's well, it really has too, yeah. Michelle, because if you silver was, let me just look at it here real quick. Silver was $18 on last Thursday, and today it's $24.5, basically. It was as high as $26 last night. So think about that from 18 to 26 in this industry to see a, what, a, almost a 40% move in, in just a few days. And it was $11.5 or so in March, over a double. So it is moving, 
and it is resembling a free market. Now, I don't want to be as bold as to say that this is over with because I felt like the little boy who cries wolf for a very long time because I've been saying this for a very long time based upon mathematics and economics and a sprinkling of logic on top of it. Uh, but in the, don't forget, in the end of the story, the little boy does see the wolf. And while no one's listening to him, he's screaming, it's here, it's here, it's here. And one of these days it will be, and maybe this is the beginning. And maybe that is why they reclassified gold. And maybe that is why the Justice Department is investigating and labeling them a criminal enterprise. Maybe we are going to see some free market trading in, the, in precious metals because if they are going to use gold, as an underpinning of, a, of the world reserve currency, it has to go much higher. And, uh, and I think it will indeed. You have Bank of America calling for $3,000 gold by next year. You have Jim Sinclair, my buddy, who says it'll go to 10,000 and it'll never come back because it'll be pegged to a new currency system. So the bottom line is I honestly believe with all the objectivity I can muster, yes, I own a precious metals company. Yes, I make my living in it. I've been also been buying it every two weeks for 30 years, and I've never missed a two-week period, ever. That was my promise to my father when we started this company in 1989, ever. I've never missed a two-week period. It's wealth to me. But the bottom line is, is that um, if it is going to be part of a new system, it has to go a whole lot higher. And I think objectively, this is just the very beginning. This is a whole new ball game in every respect from the top on down. And... Um, I, I think that it's time to pay attention, which also I'd like to talk about a concern I have as well moving forward, and that is I think this market will be defined by no product. I think we are heading in that direction because as we talked about earlier, Michelle, the, the, the no value found in the bond market. There are people that are afraid of what's happening, and the the make-believe markets that are the equity markets that the Fed and BlackRock is is propping up through ETFs and and uh, S and P and Dow futures and buying the bonds and the junk bonds and all this stuff. Um, what you're seeing is a tremendous influx, a massive influx into the precious metals industry of new business. We've done four years worth of business in the last six months, almost eight hundred million dollars in sales in six months. That is four years worth of business. We did $170 million in sales in, in March and April. These are numbers that I never would have even thought possible. We have over 2,000 new clients since March. Point I'm getting at is that people are waking up and the mainstream is popping into this market unlike anything I've ever seen, ever. It defines what is different in this market to me more than anything else. That is the defining factor. But it comes at a time when the supply chain is busted. In the first five months of the year, you had 65% of all the silver mines across the globe closed. About 20 to 25% of all the gold mines closed due to COVID. All of the refiners in uh, Europe are located, most of them in Switzerland, on the border between them and Italy. They were all closed. You had the U.S. and the Canadian Mint closed. The U.S. Mint just published something yesterday. They had a meeting last Tuesday with their uh, authorized distributors. We are one of only 24 U.S. Mint authorized distributors. And what the meeting said was that um, they cannot make both gold and silver at the same time due to social distancing. They have to choose one or the other. So they'll make gold one month, silver the next. The supply chain is busted at a time when there is massive demand coming from the mainstream. And when you talk about inflation, inflation is a whole bunch of money tracing, chasing fewer goods and services. Well, you have more money into this industry than I've ever seen at a period of time when not only are the mints way back ordered and social distancing and cutting way back on supply and on production, but don't forget the first half of the year, we have a gummed up supply chain because all of that stuff, the stuff coming out of the ground and the stuff after it's pulled out of the ground being refined was shut down for five months. It's all jammed up in the, it's a gummed up supply chain cup, coupled with massive demand and heading into the election. This market will be defined in two ways. By people who don't own any gold but have been thinking about it, listening to you, they're thinking about, geez, I should have been doing this, maybe. They will look at it as I missed the boat. Prices got too high. Here we are at all time high on gold, 1950. It was a little higher yesterday, but we're right there. 
an all-time high in U.S. dollars. It's at all-time highs against every major currency on the planet. They will think they missed it. It got too expensive. But by the people who own it and want to buy more, it'll be identified by the inability to source product in a supply chain environment that is totally screwed up. It is my single biggest concern as a precious metals owner, hands down, or as a business owner, hands down. And when I tell you I think that there's a chance there'll be nothing left to sell as we approach the end of the year, I'm dead serious because already we're seeing it's becoming harder and harder and harder, and we haven't even seen uh, you know, the trailing edge of the storm. We made it through the front end with culminating with the rioting and the looting and the burning. Here I am in Minneapolis, the epicenter of it all. I'm really concerned for the trailing edge of the storm the back end that comes as we approach the election and it's coming and it's going to end up with much higher prices and no product and nowhere safe to put your money. And I say that with, with hundred percent objectivity. I'm not trying to, to juice the sales that have already been four times anything I've ever seen ever. In fact, eight times anything I've ever seen because where we are now is four full years worth of business in the first six months of the year. I, I can't even believe the volume that we're doing and, uh, I think it's going to get crazier into the end of the year. I just hope we have product to offer people. Wow. Wow. Well, this illustrates why I felt it was so important to bring you on the show right now. Um, I want our audience to get familiar with you and what you Thank do. You. you mentioned your dad. You and your father actually started this company. It's one of the best companies that I know of. And I want to take a moment to talk about your company for everybody because you're president of Miles Franklin. You have an incredible background and expertise in precious metals. So I want to lay the groundwork to give everyone a vision of what you do, how long you've done it, what your company offers. And you're one of the only people, not just in precious metals, but in business that I know of that is the president of the company and yet he is the one every time a client comes to you they deal personally with you and you sell them the bullion then you help them diversify their portfolio and educate them upon their investment so it's extraordinary so please give us an overview Andy I'm sorry. Uh, well, not everyone deals with me. Obviously, I'd, I'd, I'd lose my mind considering we, you know, we're doing so much business, have so many people. But a lot of your listeners, if they have done business with me, with Miles Franklin, chances are it was with me. I, uh, I've been working 15, 18 hours a day talking to people since the beginning of the year. Um, it differentiates Miles Franklin. I'll answer your question up here and move backwards to our history. But one of the big dif uh, differentiating factors of our company is our personal touch. We closed our online store about a year ago because we believe there's far too much identity theft and fraud online. And it's a growing, really frightening phenomenon. We could talk about what I've seen in identity theft and uh, consumer fraud um, for a whole hour it would blow your listeners away. So we are old school. We're analog in a digital world. We do things via telephone. I pride myself at being accessible. I talk to people all day long. Um, so we'll go back. My father and I started our company together in 1989. Um, uh, we have done things the old fashioned way. We just eclipsed $6 billion in sales. We've never had a customer complaint in 30 years, not one. Your listeners can go and Google it. They won't find any. We maintain an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. We're one of only 24 authorized resellers the U.S. Mint has ever appointed. Um, we have worldwide exclusives with Brinks in, in North America. We have the only fixed rate storage program in North America based on the number of ounces people store, not on the uh, value, the percentage of asset value model that is more commonly associated with storage facilities. We have the only fully insured non-bank safe deposit box program in North America in Brinks, Toronto and Brinks, Vancouver, a North American exclusive. Uh, we have all of these accolades, never having a complaint, all of these things that we're so proud of, but the state of Minnesota doesn't care. Well, we're located in the state of Minnesota it's the only state in the United States where you have to be licensed and bonded and background checked annually in order to conduct business in precious metals. That's why probably 99%, literally nine and a half or 9.9 .9 out of 10 companies throughout the United States have boycotted Minnesota. They will not do business in my home state because if they did, they would have to be subservient to the Department of Commerce here in the state of Minnesota the way that we are, meaning 
Every single year, we have to be background checked, everyone, and held to a high, higher standard, myself included. All of my outside reps, all of my principals, all of my employees have to be background checked every single year. If any of us have a felony related to financial services, you are forever disqualified to sell precious metals in the state of Minnesota. We have to have continuing education and compliance that no other state maintains. And the biggest reason why people don't want to do business in Minnesota is the bonding. We have a seven-figure surety bond in place that backs all of our business. So if we steal everyone's money, the state of Minnesota pays them back with a $2 million surety bond. And... Uh, sends a bounty hunter to find us somewhere hiding on a beach in Tahiti. Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek, just simply meaning that what differentiates us, aside from our track record, is our licensing and bonding. In a federally non-regulated industry, Minnesota is the only state that is, meaning you could not do business with a safer company in terms of reputation, but also in terms of accreditation and bonding. That really differentiates us from everybody else. And... Um, so in terms of safety in an unsafe world and privacy in an unprivate world, um, you know, we're, we're not online, we're, we're analog and we're bonded and we're licensed and we have all of our brokers have been with us on average for over 20 years. Talk about where your storage facilities are, Andy. We have storage facilities all around North America. Uh, in Canada, we have Montreal, Toronto and Vancouver. Fixed rate structure. Um, safe deposit box programs, those are two North American exclusives. We have a storage facility in North Dakota with the Dakota Depository. I've worked with them for 30 years. We keep the majority of all of our inventory housed at the Dakota Depository. Wonderful people. And then we have a relationship with the Brinks here in the U.S. We brought down our Canadian facilities into JFK, New York City, Salt Lake City and Los Angeles, so that we have the ability to offer that same fixed rate structure here in the United States. We're the only ones that have that. And then we have a relationship with TDS, a Loomis facility on the tarmac at McCarran Airport in Las Vegas. So we can cover everyone in North America from coast to coast, wherever they are, uh, north, south, east, west, we got it covered. And the most important thing is that none of them, they may be Miles Franklin programs, but none of them are Miles Franklin storage facilities. It's very important that if you buy metal, you do not store it with the company who you bought it from. Bullion Direct proved that uh, theory to be correct a couple of years ago when they stole $35 million worth of gold that was being stored for them, and that owner is in prison. That is why I work with Loomis. That is why I work with Brinks. That is why I work with the Dakota Depository. So there is a wall between whom you bought it from, and who you are storing with. Now, it may be a Miles Franklin exclusive, but those accounts in Brinks are 100% um, segregated and allocated to that client uh, in our sub-account, but 100% segregated, allocated. And if it's in a safe deposit box, our safe deposit box program is – um, they're neat. They're brand new, state-of-the-art, one-key boxes. Not the two keys where you put one in and the bank puts one in and you open it up. These are one-key boxes where you, as the depositor, holds the only key and the only spare. You get a certificate from Brinks as to what's inside, fully insured by Lloyd's of London, and no one can access that box but you. In our other programs, they're audited twice per year by third-party auditing and 100% redundantly segregated and allocated uh, to that client. So uh, we work with the best in the business, and we make sure that there's a wall between us and whom, whomever is storing the metal to guarantee that things are done the right way. And I'm a big advocate of storing. If, it, if you're not going to be comfortable having it in your own home, don't keep it in a safe deposit box. I'd rather see you bury it in your backyard and be a midnight gardener than do that. But if you're looking to have money outside the country in Canada, because I think if the you know what hits the fan, Michelle, it's going to be in the, in the dollar realm. And the very first thing the government will do as the dollar is plunging is to impose currency controls because the inclination of the wealthy, if the dollar started to tank, the inclination of the wealthy would be to flee the dollar and buy, let's say, a Swiss denominated bond or a, a piece of real estate in Vancouver. But the act of doing that is, is a little bit more than it meets the eye. In other words, if you're going to buy a Swiss bond, you have to sell dollars and buy francs. If you're going to buy a condo in Vancouver, you need to sell dollars and buy Canadian dollars, which would exacerbate the inflation 
inflation and increase the velocity at which the dollar was falling, they would say the first thing they would do would be to close the ability to get money out of the country, impose currency controls. Having money in Canada privately, our accounts are no that carry no reporting whatsoever, no FACTA, no FBAR, no 1040. It is 100% compliant with all U.S. tax code and private that you can access and get to when others have no option if that happens. So storing money in a Brinks facility outside the country is more dual faceted than just um, having it stored. You also have protection from a potential currency crisis and, and the reaction of the U.S. government would be to close the window quickly. Right. That was just so important to touch on just in case. I think this is so important for our audience because you just touched on the fact that as we head toward the election, um, this market is going to change drastically. We have the potential of being this as the only moment to get precious metals, not just because of price, but because of availability. That's right. Absolutely. That's the most important thing. Yes. Um, Andy, there's one other thing I want to touch on before we go, and that's my favorite form of investing and something I'm very interested in and that you discuss um, thoroughly that I want you to touch on, and that's junk silver. And I think the name of this is very deceptive because people don't realize how much precious metals they have right now. So as we're headed toward this shortage in metals, I want you to define the specifics of junk silver and just how valuable is it? Well, it should be, it should be called, you're right, junk silver is a bad name. It should be called constitutional silver. It's dimes, quarters, and half dollars minted prior to 1965. Um, if you had a swimming pool filled with dimes, quarters, and half dollars prior to 1965, and you took an orange Home Depot five-gallon bucket and scooped it up, had a mix of it all in there, any way you can make a dollar is 0.715 ounces of pure silver. Any way you can make a thousand dollars a mix of dimes, quarters, and half dollars would be 715 ounces. Now, if these were never circulated, they were in mint condition, that number would be more like 723 ounces. But what it is is the most utilitarian or flexible way of owning silver that there is. And our, our currency prior to 1965 had 90% silver in it. And so it is uh, right now the best value in silver. I'm glad you asked this question. It's the best value. It offers unusual upside potential because it can't be reproduced. And it's the greatest flexibility of any form of precious metals that we sell down to the smallest unit, a, a silver dime. And, uh, you know, the amount of silver in, in a dime, 0. 0.000715, if you took 10 dimes, it's almost exactly one ounce of silver. But uh, what it is, is it's real money. And they took all the silver out of the money after 1964. They made half dollars from 1965 to 69 with 40% silver. But any dimes, quarters, and half dollars issued prior to 1965 have 90% silver by weight. And it's a great way to own silver. And in, a, in an environment where the unknown is looming, having that type of utility to be able to trade or barter or what have you is big. And uh, it might be my favorite way to own silver also. And in go buying precious metals, typically, the smaller the piece you go, the less flexibility you have. This is an unusual environment where that's not the case. So I like it a lot. I think it's a smart way to own it. Right. For everybody to realize that you probably have a lot of silver right now. Yeah, and the absolutely. coinage is becoming scarce. What is your theory on why everyone is having a hard time finding coins? Well, there's very little commerce going on with currency right now, and people are locked in their house anyway. And But I think we're being driven into a cashless society, little by little by little. They'll pull things away, and uh, I think that's what they want. They want to go cashless and keep, you know, the, keep their, their thumb upon the, the populace and, and move us in that direction. Um, you know, the bottom line is it's the coins out are, are becoming useless anyway. It's like uh, any of your listeners have ever played in a poker tournament. When you get to the final table, everyone cashes in their small chips for bigger chips. And, uh, you know, there aren't many things that dimes, quarters and, and nickels buy you any longer. But I think we're being pushed slowly into a cashless society. And there's an old saying, if you drop a frog in a pot of boiling water, it jumps up. But if you put it in a, a pot of lukewarm water and slowly turn up the heat, 
it falls asleep and dies. And that's kind of what's happening to the public here. We are being indoctrinated slowly or slowly and slowly and slowly into a cashless society. And that would be my ultimate answer to that. But also the lack of velocity of, of exchange with, with coins and currency, because people are locked in, because a lot of companies aren't accepting cash, um, it, it is just a, an issue of also of there not being enough velocity out there and, and uh, um, in retail to, you know, to, to, to get those coins in circulation the way they need to. But ultimately, I feel it's because we're moving cashless. And I think that's coming quicker than people think. Right. I had Jim Rogers on the show and he said it's coming fast, Michelle. And I didn't, I kind of, you know, how in the back of your mind you're thinking, ah, oh, you know, maybe, maybe not. He was right. And um, there's places in the world right now that are completely cashless. And the United States is sort of following suit on many counts that we're watching, many disturbing counts where we yeah. don't want to speak up for ourselves anymore as Americans. We're very, we give our way our rights very easily, it seems. And once they're gone, they don't come back either. That's right. That's right. So now is the time to really protect yourself. Um, get yourself acquainted with precious metals if you're not. Even if you're not in the position to purchase them right now, become acquainted with what's happening. Because, again, this might be one of the only times in history where we're going to be able to freely buy it in such an easy way because of the way. Well, yes. I agree. And I would like to make an offer to your listeners that I'll beat any price in the country. All your listeners need to do is email me to Andy and Miles Franklin and put your name in the subject line with as, uh, as much detail as they can in the message. And I'll beat any price in the United States for your listeners. And um, I'll get them the best price, personal service by myself or one of my trusted brokers. And if anyone's looking to, do, to, uh, to, to add some metal to their portfolio, send us an email. I'll make it worth your while, 100%. Beautiful. Just to clarify, put the name Michelle Holiday into the the subject into line. the subject line, and we will beat any price in the country. Beautiful. That's so wonderful, Andy. This has been an amazing interview. Please tell Thank everyone you. where they can go to learn more about your company, and also how they can contact you directly. Because I know that you do take calls, um, but. And also, one last thing, I'd like you to incorporate with this the best advice that you could give to anyone right now. Yeah, so I can be reached. Uh, the best way to reach me is Andy and Miles Franklin, and I will get back to people right away. I'm on the phone all day long. I made the mistake recently of putting my cell phone number out on a podcast, and I'm getting phone calls 24 hours a day. My wife wasn't too happy about that. So send me an email at Andy at Miles Franklin. I can be reached at uh, 800-822-8080. Uh, I'm easy, easily tracked down. Uh, the best advice I can give is simply this. Don't ask yourself how much gold and silver you should own. Ask yourself what exposure do you want to a currency that is, by their own admission, north of $125 trillion in debt trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. And that debt encumbered at the lowest interest rates in human history. We are entering a period of time where the dollar is, is, is close to its end and um, on many levels. And so I think precious metals is a life raft and you, you work from that and work, work backwards. What exposure do you want to that environment and work backwards and realize that there are very few alternatives anymore other than gold and silver. Think objectively, I believe that your listeners will come up with that same conclusion. That's my advice, have some precious metals and get it before it's gone into the fall, which I'm really, really concerned about. You see one more event and it, it's game over, you won't find any product. Uh, give us a try. Send me that email at Andy and Miles Franklin. I'll make it worth your listeners' uh, time. I can assure you that. Remember, we've never had a customer complaint. Your listeners will not be the first. I'll personally make sure of that. Indeed. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Michelle. I hope to come back again anytime. Yes, indeed. We're going to have you back soon. Mr. Thank Andy you. Schechtman, owner and president of Miles Franklin LTD. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.